Welcome to the uh, fourth annual Modern Monetary Theory Conference, a keynote on declarations of dependence with Scott Ferguson. Uh, Scott Ferguson is an associate professor of film and media studies at the University of South Florida and the author of the book Declarations of Dependence, Money Aesthetics and the Politics of Care. Dr. Ferguson, a huge thank you from everybody at MMN for agreeing to give this keynote on your visionary new work. Um, and a note for the audience, this event is being recorded and it will be posted uh, after the conference concludes to YouTube. So if you miss anything or you have friends who couldn't make it tonight, the event will be available for posterity. Um, and without further ado, please take, take it away to Ferguson and thank you so much again. Thank you so much. Um, thanks to the conference organizers for inviting me uh, to present on my book. I wanna um, lay out some kind of preliminary remarks before I get into uh, reading. Um, so one thing to say is that I was invited to to present um, on my book, which was um, actually published in 2018, and it was conceived really in the late Obama years, um, which feels like so long ago and uh, a very different moment. Um, when I agreed to give this talk, you know, I, I had a talk sort of that I had I have presented before, uh, before the pandemic, sort of in the wake of the, the book's immediate release, uh, that was, you know, still kind of keyed to that moment. But of course, you know, that moment had passed a little bit. Um, but I, I the, the main part of this talk, I just want to say is a little bit of a time capsule. But then I was also asked to speak to the present moment, uh, to our moment of uh, the, the um, COVID-19 pandem COVID pandemic um, and, and how my book and my various um, claims and affirmations and critiques in the book might help us to think or rethink uh, about uh, MMT and political economy and culture and aesthetics during this moment. So what I did was um, I didn't have time to rewrite an entirely new talk. <laughs> so I wrote a kind of new opening that drops us into this COVID moment and makes a kind of intervention from the point of view of my book. And then I step back and um, um, get into the, to the book talk that I've given uh, several times on, on other occasions. And then I don't ever really come back, but um, maybe in, in the Q&A we, uh, we can kind of start to connect some dots. Um, I think something else I'd like to say is that, you know, the arguments that I'm making here are sweeping. They're sweeping, they're wide ranging, they cut across multiple disciplines. Um, and if you're not following every beat, that's fine. If some of the language is, is kind of challenging, that's fine, just let it wash over you. I wanna give you just a, like a, just a little bit of like a roadmap uh, for where we're going. Basically, there, there is a dominant story that we tell about the rise of Western modernity out of the Middle Ages. This is a Western story. It's filled with all kinds of myths. And at the center of it is a story we tell about money, but not just money, um, politics, economics, freedom, power, domination, um, aesthetics, um, a whole host of interlocking um, parts. It's like a big, in my mind, a big Rube Goldberg machine. And what I do in my book um, is try to retell that story from a different perspective in order to really criticize it and really to defamiliarize it. So as I'm moving sort of across different parts of this big Rube Goldberg machine, um, that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to understand this big sweeping story that we tell in very, very different ways and in ways that are uh, oriented toward MMT, oriented toward uh, a leftist praxis, oriented toward a, a, a leftist understanding of aesthetics in, in the wake of MMT. So that's where we're going. Uh, and I think I'm gonna start uh, reading now with this sort of new intro that I've put together. When COVID-19 first roiled Italy in early 2020, the once celebrated Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben shocked leftists around the world 
By publicly denouncing the Italian government's public health measures as unjust, irrational, and even fascistic. A titan of early 21st century continental philosophy and critical theory, Agamben first earned his reputation in the early 2000s when his critical scholarship detailing how Western sovereignty hinges upon exceptional states of emergency proved a powerful description of the Bush administration's extra-legal war on terror. Borrowing heavily from the writings of Nazi jurist Carl Schmitt, Agamben had argued over the course of the 1990s that Western politics hinge upon sovereignty's capacity to suspend constitutional processes and abuse emergency powers beyond the law. The process on Agamben's account is rather paradoxical. Sovereignty must position both its own power and its powerless victims outside normative legality, but do so under the cover of state legitimacy. For Agamben, the emblematic figure for such a state of exception is the Shoah. When the Nazi regime leveraged sovereign exceptionality to corral and murder millions of Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, communists, and many others after annulling their legal rights. According to Agamben, the Holocaust is no aberration. It lays bare Western society's standard operating procedure. It is not surprising then that Agamben's analysis gained traction in the early 2000s when the Bush administration regularly leveraged extraordinary rendition and unlawful detention in legal nether zones such as Abu Ghraib and Guantanamo Bay. With the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, however, Agamben threw the reading public for a loop when he turned this same critical apparatus against government public health measures, in effect, aligning his lifelong critique of sovereignty with a growing chorus of paranoid, right-wing, libertarian, and free market detractors. In a series of initial blog posts, Agamben scoffed at suggestions that COVID-19 constitutes a damaging or deadly threat to collective well-being. He condemned public ordinances as Nazi-like encroachments upon individual liberty and interpersonal charity, while comparing the virus to an inconsequential seasonal flu. Quote, it is almost as if with terrorism exhausted as a cause for exceptional measures, the invention of an epidemic offered the ideal pretext for scaling them up beyond any limitation, end quote. Over the course of the next two years, Agamben's statements only worsened. He continues to espouse hostile and conservative views about COVID procedures, restrictions, and treatments with little sign of abatement or contrition. By February 2022, Agamben's reputation had so deteriorated in leftist and progressive circles that Adam Kotzko, a key translator of myriad Agamben texts, felt compelled to publish an article in Slate magazine clarifying his position on the now controversial philosopher he helped introduce to English reading audiences. In his article, Kotzko roundly rejects Agamben's COVID era publications. Quote, Excessive distrust, distrust of any state authority has blinded Agamben to the ways that individualistic approaches to the pandemic have reinforced corporate power while exacerbating the pandemic. The so-called essential workers, along with so many others, have been reduced to disposable bare life, not by direct state intervention, but by policies that claim to set them free, end quote. More than a flat dismissal, Kotzko's essay poses a deeper question about the structure and significance of Agamben's of. How could Agamben's seemingly nuanced and significant intellectual project come in the COVID moment to justify such brute and misanthropic conclusions? Kotzko's treatment of this quandary is complex, critical, and implicitly self-implicating. Ultimately, Kotzko distances himself from Agamben's totalizing suspicion of government. He also finds, yet he also finds mysterious promise in an earlier Agamben text, States of Exception, in which the philosopher anticipates a future 
when, quote, humanity will play with law just as children play with disused objects, not in order to restore them to their canonical use, but to free them from it for good, end quote. As much as I am sympathetic to Kotzko's subtle assessment, I find that his interpretation of Agamben's fall from intellectual esteem misses something crucial, since he, like Agamben, treats freedom as both the origin and telos of critical thought. On my reading, any commitment to freedom unthreaded through questions of collective dependence and public mediation threatens to naturalize a deeply antisocial modern Western metaphysics that have become endemic to dominant models of political economy. In such metaphysics, individual beings and things come first and governance arises subsequently through convergence or imposition. The problem with this model is that however avowedly pro-social or ecological it is on the back end, it forecloses eco-social relationality and organization as a primary and ongoing quandary. In doing so, critical thought divorces sensuous experience from abstract mediation. It casts the struggle for justice as a fatalistic zero-sum drama, and it cripples imaginative and inclusive politics which labor to account for one and all. Among the deep lessons of the COVID-19 pandemic is that dependence is not a condition we turn on and off like a faucet, and that liberties are conditioned, sorry, are collectively provisioned, not naturally born and then artificially lost and gained. The pandemic's ongoing challenges, failures, and devastations remind us not merely that we need one another as individuals, even when we are physically apart, but also that broad-scale governance and organizations diversely mediate eco-social life from start to finish. For this reason, the hysterical and often violent outcries for liberty that crop up during the pandemic period should be interpreted symptomatically. Far from straightforward demands, such rejoinders unconsciously betray their own reliance on the thicket of institutional and legal supports from which they wish to escape. If the Agamben pandemic debacle teaches us anything, it is not simply that neoliberalism uses freedom against us or that there is a chance to shirk legality through imminent play. It is that freedom in its dominant modern Western construction remains a thin and misleading basis for critical theory and practice. As the black freedom struggle and other civil rights movements have long demonstrated, liberty remains a fundamental value for overcoming slavery, carcerality, and predation. Yet as such struggles also frequently remind us, freedom is a function of collective dependence and governance not an origin or end in itself. Such is the argument I flesh out in my 2018 monograph, Declarations of Dependence, Money, Aesthetics, and the Politics of Care, the focus of my talk this evening. Taking eco-social dependence seriously, Declarations reconsiders one of the most important yet least understood problem in critical theory, money. In particular, the book reimagines Western modernity's fraught and by most accounts exhausted dialectical opposition between money and aesthetics. To do so, I rethink the social character and value of abstraction in general, a matter that I believe critical theory has largely misconstrued. I challenge previous critical theorists from Theodora Adorno to Frederick Jameson, who focus on abstraction's major role in ordering modern life, but claim that abstraction and with it money essentially alienate eco-social relations from allegedly primary material bases. On my analysis, such Marxist and at bottom liberal presumptions have long impaired critical theory's forays into aesthetics as well as its capacities to envision radical, social, and ecological transformations. Indeed, political organization always partakes of remote and hence abstract orchestrations in ways that at once subtend and exceed material propinquity. Abstractness, therefore, 
conditions not only the distribution of power across political economy and sensuous aesthetic experiences, but also the difficulties and possibilities of care. To reorient money and aesthetics toward this more capacious understanding of abstraction, I turn to the conception of money articulated by modern monetary theory, or MMT, the heterodox school of political economy to which the modern money network is dedicated. For MMT, as we know, monetary abstraction is not a private, finite, and hence alienable technology that is coextensive with the market, as both mainstream and Marxist economics hold. Money, MMT argues, is something more like a, though there's my MMT slide, something more like an inalienable public utility. Unlike with the relative finitude that defines material resources, money operates through abstract inscriptions and collective coordinations. It is for this reason genuinely inexhaustible. According to MMT, then, it is because, not despite abstraction, that money contains still unrealized possibilities for inclusive transformation and, as I argue, care. Mobilizing MMT, I move beyond tired dialectical oppositions that pit aesthetic abundance and communality against monetary privation and greed. Rather, I affirm the emphatically abstract bases of embodied social production across monetary and aesthetic domains. I set the modern relationship between political economy and aesthetics a more expansive and interdependent premises. And I inaugurate a new practice of critical theory, which seeks to actualize money's curative potentials in a sensuous here and now. To do so, I critique Western modernity's ongoing repression of abstractions, aesthetic possibilities, by way of a fresh critical examination of its physics-based visual culture, from Renaissance perspectival painting to what I call the hyper-Newtonian blockbusters of the neoliberal era, along with video games. In what follows, I share some of my book's primary provocations in an effort to transcend the deadlocks that haunt aesthetic praxis from the Renaissance to neoliberalism while making critical theory freshly ansible to future politics. The book's main theses unfold across four main body chapters, which I will briefly summarize here before teasing out more specific rhetorical threads in greater detail. And just so you have a sense of where we're going, I'm gonna kind of take you through a, a breezy tour through the chapters, <laughs> through very unbreezy chapters, and then we'll kind of circle back and take on elements um, um, that I've already laid out and, and kind of deepen them and flesh them out some more. Okay, so chapter one, titled Transcending the Aesthetic, in that chapter, I sketch a genealogy of MMT in critical dialogue with Marxism. From there, I read Western modernity's misleading dialectical opposition between money and aesthetics as a debilitating symptom of the hegemonic liberal conception of money that Marxism shares. In place of this seemingly interminable dialectic, I draw the aesthetic's historical dedication to sensory and social enrichment entirely within money's commodious fiscal structure, aiming to redeem money and aesthetics alike. Chapter two, titled Declarations of Dependence, that's where the book title comes from, risks the perhaps surprising thesis that money constitutes the center of collective caretaking in modern life. Developing what I term a politics of care, I turn to the Roman myth of cura to tease out an alternative definition of care. Reading the cura myth alongside works by Martin Heidegger and Judith Butler, I claim that care is irreducible to the embodied, altruistic, and often feminized and racialized activity to which liberal modernity often reduces it. Rather, care, as I characterize it, is an in sorry, inescapable and enigmatic charge that derives from collective dependence but frequently goes unheeded. On this expanded reading, care is not willing choice or thankful, sorry, 
thankless altruism. It is the constitutive problematic that conditions collective and individuated lives from macro to micro register. So care here is a problem that we all variously share. It's not something that individuals do. I mean, it is what individuals do, but it's not just that. It's what we collectively share. Approaching money through this alternative conception of care, I shift critical theory's principal concern for, for overwrought problems of freedom and power to repressed riddles of social dependence and ecological maintenance. Finally, I outline a fresh symptomology of care by drawing on the object relations school of psychoanalysis. Whereas psychoanalysis's uh, traditional Oedipal logics root symptoms and contradictions between desirous subjects and paternal laws and very patriarchal ways, the object relations school variously permits me to read cultural artifacts as cryptic signs of care's historical yearnings contradictions and failures while leveraging the resulting insights toward broad political demands. My third chapter develops a new historical and theoretical framework for imagining the money relation in modernity. It does so by contesting conventional accounts of modern history that foreground the allegedly spontaneous emergence of merchant and banking activity in the Italian peninsula during the high Middle Ages. Titled Medium Congruentissimum, which is Latin for communal medium, chapter three traces money's modern European ascent back to the late medieval papacy's broad scale fiscal tax system and the aesthetics and theology that supported this system. Specifically, I track a well-known shift in Western metaphysics that, on my analysis, first reveals, then conceals the topology and capacities of money that MMT today makes perceptible. During the High Middle Ages, for example, the scholastic theology of Thomas Aquinas and the Gothic and Byzantine aesthetics represented by uh, let's say cathedrals, envision social and material provision provisioning as a far reaching and centralized, what I call cascade of dependence. That's not exactly Aquinas's words, but that's, I prefer this to the, uh, the kind of cliche reified um, figure of the great chain of being, which, which suggests a kind of rigid hierarchy. And I'm not sure that that's actually what fully what's going on here. Um, I think there's something much more rich and, and variegated and open, even if we can still critique it. So, um, uh, ta -ta 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 -ta. This cascade of dependence mediated by multiple levels of abstraction. In the tumultuous 14th and 15th centuries, however, Franciscan theologians and humanist writers and artists rejected this vision of the real for an immediate metaphysics of thisness, or in Latin, hechiity. You can say hexiity. Um, other people say hechiity. I say hechiity. So hechiity means thisness. Deeming broad scale mediation an artificial, arbitrary, and ultimately unnecessary assertion of sovereign will, Franciscans and humanists variously reduced being in general, and money in particular, to a contingent and ever alienable hechiity, setting the groundwork for the rise of liberal modernity. And it's a long rise, it takes a while. In chapter three, I recuperate the spirit of high medieval mediation neither as a defense of the Catholic Church, whether yesterday or today, nor as a, a nostalgic uh, call for a return to better days, but rather as a way of attuning critical theory anew to the crises and possibilities of modern money and aesthetics. Chapter four, Allegories of the Aesthetic, uncovers what I see as the repressed historical secret of the modern aesthetic project within what I call Western modernity's gravitropic visuality or gravitational. Gravitropic just means sort of turning on gravity. Born with perspectival painting during the Florentine Renaissance, the modern era's gravitropic visuality simulates spectatorial immersion, contiguous movement, and a universally enjoyed material gravity. In doing so, I claim, it represses inscriptions, abstract and non-contiguous qualities 
that shaped medieval iconography while expressing a wish to, rede to redeem the proximate hechiety that later British sentimentalists and German idealists make the basis of the modern aesthetic project. In time, various modernisms and avant-garde challenged this gravitropic visuality with overt abstractions, yet it returned with a vengeance in the neoliberal era with the rise of the new Hollywood blockbuster and triple A video games. Following a symptomatic analysis of such hyper Newtonian media, I conclude declarations of dependence with an exhortation to divest modern sensory existence of visuals, visual culture's gravitropic assurances and to embrace abstraction across monetary and aesthetic realms. So in the remainder of this presentation, I wanna highlight and expand some of my book's interlocking claims of the, over the course of three sections. First, I explicate the constrictive modern metaphysics of hechiety that so constrain care in Western modernity. Second, I turn a critical eye toward modernity's gravitropic visuality in order to rethink the historically vexed problem of aesthetics. Third, I consider abstraction's present political and aesthetic stakes by looking closely at the hyper-Newtonian Disney blockbuster, Big Hero 6. So we're going all over the place, high culture, low culture, middle ages, uh, more contemporary stuff. Um, so hold on. Part one, modern metaphysics, the big squeeze. My contention in declarations of dependence is that uh, while the uh, problem of care ontologically precedes the money relation. Money is a dominant means for politically organizing the mystery of our shared collective interdependence. Yet, as I argue in my third chapter, the calamity of Western modernity is that its dominant conception of money is predicated upon a contracted metaphysics of hechiety, thisness. Arising in Franciscan theology and humanist methods during the 14th and 15th centuries, Hechiri forecloses care's central locus and wide mediating breadth, right? A sense of we're all, we're all caught up in this thing together in a, in a big, big way. To understand this historical break in Western metaphysics, one must comprehend Thomas Aquinas' synthesis of the scholastic tradition from which Hechiri departs. Writing during the great political and economic expansion of the high Middle Ages, Thomas argued that being takes the shape of a centralizing, inalienable, and inescapably interdependent cascade of being. While no doubt reliant upon the contiguous comings and goings of individual creatures and things, this boundless cascade realizes the broad labor of creation all at once, via its entire in interconnected infrastructure. Thomas's metaphysics sought to make sense of the late medieval periods ballooning political economy and converging in diverse cultures. Such metaphysics are perhaps best emblematized by the inexhaustible ooh, transubstantiation of the Eucharist on disparate altars. But they also undergird Thomas's writings on angels, whose non-lotive movement permits instant passage from one location to another without coursing through intervening space. And whenever I think about this, I think about you know, explaining you know, how banking works. Still more miraculous from a modern perspective is the fact that Thomas's metaphysics served as the basis for MMT-like conceptions of a boundless fiscal apparatus in the late medieval period, what Juris from Bracton to Accursius referred to as the Fictus, oh sorry, Fiscus Sanctissimus, or Most Holy Fisc. In the centuries following Thomas's time, late medieval Europe entered a long and painful period but beset by countless political, economic, and environmental crises. Responding to these crises, Franciscan theologians, such as Duns Scotus, and William of Ockham and humanists from Petrarch to Erasmus challenged the Thomistic synthesis with a new metaphysics and a recognizably modern social topology. 
This metaphysical topos, decentered Thomism's boundless cascade, reconstituting the Christian God as an absolute and immediate willing power in the world, a kind of sovereign tyrant. In so doing, the Franciscans and humanists variously contracted dependency's wide causal breadth into a contiguous and ultimately alienable thisness. And the Franciscans used this term hechiety. They coined the term hechiety. The, um, the humanists hated all of this language. They thought it was a bunch of abstract nonsense, but they all tended to agree and influence one another in thinking that where reality happens is uh, direct, immediate particulars. Increasingly, this new modern topology reduced being to self-standing individuality and causality to efficient relations directly between individual creatures or things or God and things. While deeming anything like concurrent mediation at a distance all at once, either unnecessary, artificial, or downright impossible. Over time, the topos of Hechiety became the unquestioned metaphysical backdrop for an ascendant modernity, lending direction, rhythm, and significance to everything from political economy to aesthetics. It enabled influential Franciscans and humanists to reject Thomas, Thomistic visions of an incorruptible holy fisc and to re-envision money as an, as an alienable medium of exchange. It spurred... It spurred, oh, sorry. Oh, where'd it go? Where's my, I'm off on my slides. Oh no, it's stuck. Okay, I'll just keep reading. Um, it spurred uh, Renaissance visual and literary culture to supplant Gothic and Byzantine abstract, abstract figurations of immediate sensuous embodiment and, um, and, and a passionate material gravitas. At the same time, uh, these metaphysical commitments to an immediate willing potency saw political philosophers from Machiavelli to Hobbes reimagine the polis primarily in terms of power, subordinating care's vast and variegated scaffolding to the status of a weak, naive, and often feminized supplement. A key historical contribution to this process was reformed Christianity and the early modern wars of religion. Staging what was essentially a tax revolt against the papacy, Reformed Christianity variously jettisoned the church's feminized mediations, symbolized by the Virgin Mary, while promising a more intimate relationship with the Divine Father through an intensified personal faith and direct access to biblical interpretation. Justifying a period of destructive religious wars, reform Christianity, and corresponding counter-reformation on the part of the church precipitated the exclusionary political consolidations now erroneously associated with the so-called Westphalian settlement, which in turn birthed the modern system of fiscally strapped and financially unstable nation-states. Finally, modern modernity's Hachidi metaphysics cast the mold for an emergent philosophy and practice of the aesthetic. Set against monetary abstraction while mirroring its dreams of expansive proximity, the aesthetic aimed to cure the inadequacies of liberalism's alienating and destructive money form. And this was explicit. Only it sought to save the modern bourgeoisie by redeeming the same poisonous hechiety that conditioned liberal money's myriad deficiencies in the first place. So here's part two, the aesthetic, there, there. Rethinking the rise and nature of the modern aesthetic project, my book radically transvalues what is arguably one of critical theory's central historical preoccupations, abstraction. For critical theorists, the problem of modernity lies in the inscrutable relationship between monetary abstraction and the productions of sensuous life as a whole. Generally speaking, critical theory's contribution to this problem rests upon two interrelated insights. The first, Frederick Jameson states quite clearly, money is what he calls the fundamental source 
of abstraction in modern life. The second concerns monetary abstraction's fundamental influence on representation writ large. In T.J. Clark's words, money is the root form of representation in modern society. I largely concur with these insights. However, I part company with critical theory's commitment to an original thisness because this attachment to hachiety presumes monetary abstraction inevitably subtracts something from embodied sociality. What is worse, it tacitly accepts that social production governed by abstraction must be stamped by carelessness. To rebuff this reduction of abstraction to carelessness is to recuperate aesthetics for politics and to transfigure critical theory's interpretation of aesthetic artifacts. Refusing vulgar reductions and determinations, the best critical theory reads sensuous artifacts as genuine socio-historical riddles in the face of the bourgeois aesthetic projects historical failures to redeem the modern world. Such work gives voice to historical suffering while grasping toward a more just tomorrow. For my part, I not only place money's boundless center at the heart of such inquiries, I also diagnose the modern aesthetic project itself as a symptom of liberal modernity's relentless attachment to hitchity. And I disclose the unconscious wish that drives the aesthetic project, or so I claim, through a fresh reading of modernity's dominant gravitropic visuality. And that's where we're turning now. Born with the perspectival painting of Renaissance Florence, modernity's gravitropic visuality has long been recognized for its pursuit of mimetic likeness, or the so-called imitatio naturae principle. On the standard interpretation, Quattrocento uh, perspective is said to break with the abstract, iconic, and unapologetically uh, uh, paratactic pictorial strategies of Gothic and Byzantine visual culture, and instead derives its forms from the structure of nature and natural perception. With parallel lines that converge at one or more vanishing points, Renaissance perspective promises to open a transparent window onto embodied relations in the real world. Suspicious of the point of view perspectivalism produces, Marxist critics have underscored its links to the possessive individualism of the Florentine Renaissance and then modern liberal life. Such arguments follow Marxist critiques of money in that they accuse an abstract form of naturalizing social domination and economic alienation. The abstractions of Renaissance perspective carve out a disembodied and idealized position of mastery for the viewing subject to whom they extend an illusion of transparency. The result allows the bourgeois subject to imagine holding dominion over the world and possessing myriad objects. As in Marxist critiques of money, however, the dubious mathematics of Renaissance perspective, in, a, in fact, dominate the subject that they establish and alienate its illusory viewpoint from the connections to the material and social world. On my interpretation, Renaissance perspective is neither natural nor properly abstract, and the historical significance of Quattrocento pictorialism has little to do with oppositions between transparency and opacity. Instead, I argue, Renaissance perspective constructs a gravitational or what I call a gravitropic phenomenology that aims to materially embrace the viewer and viewed in a relationship of material propinquity, no matter how stable or unstable, transparent or unique, that relation may appear. This phenomenology places the spectatorial body in the here and now of a geometrically projected scene. More important, it physically anchors the embodied viewpoint in a distributed array of light and heavy figures suggesting a world held together by invisible forces of gravitational attraction above all that include the viewing position itself. This overlooked phenomenology harbors 
an unconscious collective wish, a wish to physically secure social mediation at a distance through gravity's invisible contiguous force. In the face of money's alienable thisness, gravitropic visuality cradles the sensorium in its all-encompassing material grasp. It mediates social relations between near and far, seen and unseen, and does so in a manner that abjures what humanist Lorenzo Valla dismissed as the, quote, weightless ravings of Thomistic scholasticism and the ethereality of Gothic and Byzantine visuality. With this, Renaissance Perspective's gravitropic phenomenology seeks to make good on the anemic hechiety that organizes the money relation throughout the European Renaissance, rendering hechiety a totalizing and all-inclusive relation of material propinquity. Quattrocento Perspective at once reduces relationality to contiguity and imagines that this contiguity is capable of holding the social totality together. There, there, it whispers, just as all that is solid melts into air. In the centuries that followed the rise of Renaissance painting, its passionate gravitropism became the underlying topos of modern consciousness, and I suggest an archetype for the modern aesthetic project as a whole. Indeed, as scholar Michael Friedman has demonstrated, Immanuel Kant's critique of judgment is not only responsible for giving this project its fundamental expression, but also did so by refashioning Isaac Newton's theory of universal gravitation to imagine the aesthetic sphere as a distinct modern site of sensuous and communal salvation. It is true, Friedman explains, that Kant's transcendental thinking eschewed the substantive forces proffered by Newton. He made no explicit mention of the Englishman's theological characterization of gravity as, quote, an emanative effect of God and an affection of every kind of being. Yet throughout his later writings, Friedman shows, Kant fashioned the aesthetic project in the image of gravity's universal materiality and affectivity. Quote, Kant saw a deep analogy between the community of all rational beings in a moral realm of ends and the thoroughgoing community affected by among all material bodies in the universe by universal gravitation. This brings me to my book's culminating thesis. That is, modernity's gravitropic visuality reveals both the hidden secret of the aesthetic project and its catastrophic limitations. Like perspectival painting, the aesthetic constitutes a gravitropic form of care, rejecting abstract mediation at a distance that it associates with money. The aesthetic's gravitropic embr embraces stretches Hachidi to its maximal capacity in hopes of saving the social totality. Tragically, however, the aesthetic has proven incapable of fulfilling its historical charge of securing the social and material order. On my argument, then, the aesthetic signals the failure of Hachidi, the constraining limits of which modern care, sorry, the constraints the constraining limits of modern care and the punishing austerity of modern political economy. A vital and by now inextricable feature of modern life, the aesthetic project has in many ways superseded the church as the primary contributor of sensuous artifacts and experiences and thoughts to political, economic, cultural domains. In making the aesthetics bounded gravity, the site of collective salvation, however, liberal modernity turned us away from money's limitless center, obliging aesthetic praxis to contribute far more than it can afford. Contemporary theorists know the hopelessness of this charge, but they do not perceive its conditions. Melancholically renouncing the dialectic between money and aesthetics, many contemporary critical theorists fail to detect the problematic history of this relation or to imagine a genuinely curative way forward. To transcend this impasse, critical theorists after MMT must discern and treat its entrenched symptomology. 
So by this, I mean not just critique it, but, but treat it symptomatically as, as an expression of, of real suffering, even if it's in these dominant forms. Such symptoms include Marxism's own preoccupations with gravity, as well as the immersive Baroque physics of new Hollywood blockbusters and AAA video games. As I demonstrate in my book, these hyper-Newtonian media announce both the collapse and exhaustion of the imagined historical dialectic between money and aesthetics in the neoliberal era by compulsively making gravitropic salvation into a global commercial spectacle and deeply meaningful experience. Their immersive thrill rides collapse the difference between abstraction and physics, pronouncing the death of the aesthetic's moneyless utopia by serving as corporate cash cows while rendering the phenomenological structures of money's boundless center illegible. Still, for all of their problems, such media forms represent deeply meaningful symptoms that call out for attention and care. While riddled with self-destructive contradictions, hypernewtonian media unconsciously express underlying declarations of dependence, impassioned demands for a more expansive, diverse, and secure collectivity in the face of neoliberalism's false ideological reduction of monetary and aesthetic abstraction to an unanswerable global flux. Now, of course, this has shifted a bit, I think, since the late Obama era, uh, now that we've seen all kinds of neo-fascisms, but we can save that for uh, a later uh, discussion. Now I wanna to move to part three. Wither abstraction, are you satisfied with your care? To model a way of treating today's hyper-Newtonian symptoms, I conclude with Disney's computer animated feature, Big Hero 6, as promised, which raises a question that cuts to the core of neoliberal media and the fate of the aesthetic project, not to mention the neoliberal blockbuster. Each time the film's inflatable healthcare robot, Baymax, performs treatment, he asks, are you satisfied with your care? According to his programming, only a yes will suffice. For a media form that doles out lessons to its consumers, this affirmation seems cunningly reflexive and ideologically pernicious. Throughout Big Hero 6, Baymax's programming is played for humor. At the film's climax, however, his query becomes a source of fatal and seemingly uh, the source of a fatal and seemingly impossible decision. And it's a really, really moving scene. Free floating in an alternative dimension. Oh, are you satisfied with your care? Right, so here we are. Free floating in an alternative dimension of ponderous volumetric space, Baymax is damaged and can no longer use the majority of his powers. Thus stranded, he and protagonist Hero reach out to stabilize each other's movements. With this, Hero and Baymax return us to the origins of early, early modernity's gravitropic visuality. Recalling the figure of Francis reaching toward God's hand in Giotto's St. Francis renounces his father, the pair evoke above all Michelangelo's creation of Adam, wherein God's outstretched finger expresses the narrow and contingent foundations of human existence, according to the metaphysics of Hachiri of the Renaissance. Conjuring countless similar arrangements in hyper-Newtonian media, their interlocked grip also points to the original computer-generated hand created by Pixar founder and later president of Walt Disney Studios, Ed Catmull, in 1972. A wireform construction featured in the 1976 film Future World, Catmull's hand pioneered the Renaissance-style polygon projection techniques that have grounded more than four decades of abstract practical and computer graphics in fantasies of immediate material touching. As they drift together and without recourse, Baymax offers to use his fist an operational rocket to propel Hero back to safety. Because every hyper-Newtonian action has its reaction, however, this means Baymax will be pushed deeper into the ether where he will perish alone. 
Committed to this strategy, Baymax must nonetheless ask his routine question and receive a, an affirmative answer. When he asks Hero, are you satisfied with your care? The boy struggles to discover a way to save them both. There is no time, Baymax retorts, before reiterating his question. Rebuffed again, Baymax summons the origins of the blockbuster by way of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Hero, he pledges, I will always be with you. To which the boy weepingly replies after another embrace, I'm satisfied with my care. It's this kind of resignation. Hero rides Baymax's fist to safety, but his caretaker drifts toward the image's vanishing point and will eventually be swallowed by Quattrocento Perspective's crushingly limited schema of the infinite. Are we satisfied with our care? Yes or no? Such is the choice we face when it comes to the modern dialectic between money and aesthetics and the eco-social dilemmas lying ahead. The conclusion to Big Hero 6 offers the neoliberal path forward. At the end of the film, Baymax returns to Hero in the form of a memory chip, enclenched securely in the detachable fist he rode to safety. A token of hachiety, the chip is a compact vehicle for storing abstract information that attains its place and significance against a gravitropic background. Delimited in space and contingent with respect to time, the memory chip permits Hero to give back to Baymax and thereby help him keep his caregiver's promise. As with the aesthetic project as a whole, Big Hero 6 answers neoliberalism's zero-sum logic with a caring and mutually reciprocating hachiri. From MMT's vantage, of course, this takes the very form of neoliberalism and as such represents a historical road to nowhere. That is why to truly retain the force of the aesthetic project for a just and sustainable future, we must refuse neoliberalism's false and austere choices and unfold both money and aesthetics into abstractions, boundless and inalienable embrace. Care, in other words, is a distinctly abstract business, which should never be reduced to immediate material forces or delimited to possi the possibilities ascribed therein. Indeed, if, as labor organizer Sarah Nelson shrewdly reminds us, solidarity is a force stronger than gravity, then it will be necessary to collectively seize the means of, of abstraction before we can hope to take flight. Thank you. While people are typing, I guess I have like one initial question and I apologize because it will probably be the least intelligent question of the night. Um, but I found the parallels that you were drawing between, you know, far away and long ago um, kind of aesthetics, like art that was being made hundreds of years ago and art that's being made now. Um, how much of the references that you're referring to, you know, there was like the picture from like Toy Story of like the, like touching the fingers and stuff. E.T. Um, E.T., yeah, exactly. How much of that do you think is conscious um, on the part of the people who are making the movies and like making the media? And how much of it do you think is kind of like a, a subconscious expression of like, of this, the like, pattern that you're recognizing in this, like, I, I guess force is the wrong word because I know it's like playing into what you're talking about, but um, uh, like the project that you're describing. No, that's a great question. It's actually something I, I, str I struggle with all the time. And, you know, I mean, I can, I, the answer is both and, and it's just a question of what, right? So, you know, uh, Spielberg knows what he's doing um, when he creates a poster that looks like a Michelangelo painting, right? I mean, that's deliberate, right? Is he expressing the dominant gravitropic metaphysics of Hichiri of Western Medina? No, I mean, he, he's not thinking that at all, but he has that as a reference point. Um, I will say that, um, you know, I, I'm teaching an animation class um, this semester and we just studied, we just studied Pixar and some of their early shorts that led up to Toy Story. And, you know, if you read their writings, the writings of John Lasseter and uh, Ed Catmull and um, all the all the people behind it, they're very overt. They're they're very overt about 
their commitment to um, Newtonian mechanics and inertia and physics. And um, uh, it's a very complicated relationship because they think they're hearkening back to the golden era, 1930s and 1940s Disney, which was also sort of lightly gravitropic, but they're doing so in such a, a, a radical and kind of much more constricted way. Um, I, um, Alvy Ray Smith, who's one of the co-founders of Pixar, who hated Steve Jobs and quit as soon as Steve Jobs bought it, but he was one of the foundational members. He's written a book that came out just in the last year or two called, I think, um, the biography of a pixel or something like this. And it's this sweeping history starting from cave paintings to take us to the modern digital moment. And um, he talks about the emergence of the dominant forms of computer graphics that he was associated with. And he said, you know, the, the era that he sort of inherited, but then helped to further established what he called, and he puts it in capital letters, the central dogma of computer graphics. It's all in caps. Not, I mean, the, the first letters are in caps, not all the, the, not all the letters. And he, he says, um, Euclidean geometry, Cartesian, you know, uh, coordinates and Newtonian mechanics. So they know what they're doing in the sense that they have these models um, and they know where they come from. Do they know that they are uh expressing this underlying kind of liberal and and in this case neoliberal sort of ideology and metaphysics not necessarily very interesting thank you um and it seems like we have yeah a lot of sparked interest okay so i am going to unmute raul oh which okay let's see so, Raul, if you want to speak, you're going to have to go to the bottom of your screen. If you see the little audio guy down there and click that and switch yourself to microphone. And then I can give you permission. But until I see the little microphone, you can't speak. So while you figure that out, I'll just ask the question uh, that somebody posted in the chat. Um, yeah, it's, it's the leave audio button. Uh, so Matt asked... Um, he said, really interested in a variety of the stuff that you and Money on the Left do, but sometimes has a hard time connecting the media analysis to the more practical elements of your work, like the push for uni. Yeah. Um, could you draw this out if it exists? And does that kind of analysis help you better conceptualize the latter? Yeah, that's a great question. So, um, you know, I, I do I do think of my project and our Money on the Left Collective project um, as a way of transforming and redeeming the, the tradition of critical theory, which, you know, we sort of, we, we, we sort of imagine it emerges with the Frankfurt School and, and the various fellow travelers, and then, you know, continues to develop and diversify in ways that include queer theory and post-colonial theory and um, uh, you know, abolitionism and, you know, it's it, big, big tent. Um, and I think maybe not abolitionism here, but the, I think that the main line of critical theory has, uh, has a diagnostic project, a very sophisticated diagnostic project that is trying to not take the dominant discourses word for what's going on and bring out contradictions, tensions, problems, un, unemphasized or unrealized possibilities. And th there's a kind of work of hermeneutics of interpretation that comes along with that, um, that, you know, unsettles the kind of status quo. Critical theory was defined against a kind of conventional or normative theory, which was sort of progressivist and was just trying to shore up um, shore up the dominant order in its values. Critical theory uh, attends to critical comes from this word crisis, um, and it, it attends to the crises of the day, um, not just you know the fact that things are getting better. Let, let, let's explain how everything works in such a great way. Um, so the problem is that I think because on my reading, because critical theory was working with a liberal Marxist understanding of money. It was extremely fatalistic. 
um, you know, they couldn't get on board uh, in the way that, let's say, the pragmatists like John Dewey would um, to, to think about constructive world building, right? And I think, I think of what we, what I do and what we do at Money on the Left is honoring and transforming and transvaluing that diagnostic hermeneutic process, but it's not just to like figure out the world or make sense of it. It's, it's, you know, how we engage with the world, how, how we read the world, you know, whether it's in our books or in our tweets or it's in our podcasts shapes what the meaning of the world is, right? And then that work unsettles, critiques, and affirms in ways that are that are um, that open us up, hopefully, to constructive projects like the uni. Is there a direct, like, flat application or you movement from one to the other? No, but I think that I think we think of our collective project at Money on the Left as. Um, sort of in participating and engaging with aesthetics and culture uh, in ways that are expressing the values that we want to see enacted through policy um, as much as through, you know, art or pop culture or what have you. So I don't know if that's a um, satisfying answer to that question. Um, I'm sure that they will put more in the chat. I thought that was satisfying. Uh, we have more questions coming in in the chat. Unfortunately, I think a lot of people can't unmute because of the way that they uh, the, configured their settings coming in. Yeah. So if you all could just post your questions in the chat to the extent uh, that you can, that would be great. Um, so the next question is from Erica. Um, and they say, lovely talk, Scott. I'm wondering if I could follow on this line of aesthetics. You're called to seize the means of abstraction and then to think about institutions where we make culture. Is there an MMT vision of education, perhaps aesthetic education, that is the care work of schooling, whether that's small children or students or lifelong models? What does a left MMT education project look like? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, one of the, thank you, Erica. Um, I think one of, uh, one thing I want to say here is that you know, as I described at the beginning of the talk that it's, I'm, I'm, I'm taking one sweeping history of, I mean, it's so, it's so reified. It's so status quo, this history that I'm, I'm rethinking and I'm admittedly rethinking in, I'm, I'm rereading it. Um, sort of sticking sticking to those dominant texts, right? So um, I don't want to suggest that this is all of what you know modern life has ever brought, right? The modern life is diverse. Modern life is contradictory. It's got all kinds of tensions. There's all kinds of possibilities. It's not for me just a false story. If if it sounds like you know I'm suggesting that there are bad transformations happening it's because i'm just specifically reading that just so story and i'll say that to a certain extent i think of what i'm doing i mean it's based on research i'm i'm a researcher i'm a thinker i'm a theorist i i make connections i i read things but it's also a kind of counter myth making and a kind of counter myth making as 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 a way of of educating in more capacious ways is there is there an mnt theory of education um, oh, geez, I don't know if I have a, uh, like a ready-made answer for that. And I feel like I could answer that in, in lots of ways. I think clearly when we, when we think about the uni project, extending, um, the finance franchise to, uh, public university systems, um, my colleagues and I, at uh, money on the left that, that have worked on this have, um, you know, we, it's not just about finance, it's about, it's about democracy and, and participation and diversity. Um, so I guess that's one dimension. Um, I think another dimension would be um, a commitment to public education at all levels. I don't know if I'm saying anything that's that, that new. I mean, a commitment to public education at all levels and, and you know, lifelong learning um, is also something that I, I stand behind. 
but I don't know, you know, and it may be a sense that, that there's really no aspect of life that isn't, that isn't con- caught up in education, right? We're all, education is something that, that's constantly happening everywhere. And um, so I guess I would want to affirm that in, in, in democratic, you know, non-alienating ways. Excellent. And I uh, apologize for cutting you off earlier, Raul. Um, I think Raul was able to get the audio working. So if you want to ask your question next. Muted. (laughs) We still can't hear you. We can't (laughs) hear you. No, I still can't hear you. Sorry, Raul. Can't type it? Okay. <laughs> and now we're watching you type Okay. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll do the next one. Raul, check up on your mic settings, because that might be why it's not letting you speak. Um, but going on to the next question in the chat. This one's from Lauren. Um, so do you have any advice for people looking to get into your work? I'm pretty new to MMT and I'm really interested in exploring the intersection with aesthetics, but find myself getting lost frequently. I feel like my unfamiliarity of broader critical theory at the academic level is a hindrance. And I'm not sure if I just need to be an academic to penetrate it or whether I'm approaching it wrong. Oh boy. So thanks for your question. Yeah. I mean, admittedly, admittedly, I, I'm, I'm working in, you know, what's an esoteric tradition, even though, you know, I mean, a lot of people are involved in the esoteric tradition. It's not, you know, it's not like a tiny cult or anything. Um, yeah, I mean, lifelong learning. I mean, it, it's taken me a really long time to, to, to learn all these things. Um, gosh, where to start? Um, you know, I think a lot of the superstructure podcasts might be a place to start where we're, we're trying to work with critical theory in new ways. Um, you know, uh, reaching out to me and just having a phone call or, a, uh, you know, a video conference with me and we can talk about it. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm usually willing to do that kind of thing. Um, uh, yeah, that's a, it's such a great question. I mean, I guess, what I always tell my students in my theory courses is that when when one is working in this tradition of critical theory, um, you know, it's challenging and it's it's always filled with terms and references that we don't know. And the the trick is to not approach it as if um, the goal was to understand every absolutely everything that's going on on every in, on every page with every word. Um, um, but rather to engage with it where you're at and ask questions and look things up that interest you. Um, And, um, you know, nobody ever becomes the master of it. Nobody, you know, knows all of it. You know, if I open up a page, if I open up a book by Adorno, you know, and I read it cover to cover, I don't understand every single thing that he's up to, um, which is kind of one of the reasons I um, I appreciate it because there's still something kind of mysterious. but yeah, you can also like, I don't know if you're on Twitter, you can you can tweet and ask questions. I mean, and then like, if you just want to get into, if you're interested in learning about critical theory, there's plenty of web pages that one can, you know, check out, you know, people have personal pages dedicated to different critical theory topics and scholars. Um, and then, you know, there's like the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy that has a lot of good um, accessible material. Um, so there's all kinds of resources. Thank you. I love that. I love the, um, what you said about, you know, being able to read difficult texts and kind of forgive yourself for not understanding every little piece. Of yeah. It. Yeah. A barrier to people like engaging with things that might be hard and that you might not get right away. If you think, like, yeah. oh, no, I have to get the whole thing. I, I, yeah, I love and that. I'll say too, that, you know, I think, textbooks are nice and, and they, they nicely boil things down and they're, you know, they're good for 
they can be good for teaching and um, uh, you know bringing bringing lots of information together, but they also sometimes create an impression because we rely on them so heavily in our educational culture. They they create the impression that texts need to be transparent windows, and if they don't feel like transparent windows, like if there's all kinds of opacities, um, that somehow either the text is broken or you're broken or both. And, you know, life is messy, you know, not most things aren't just easily transparent to us. So why should our text be? Awesome. Um, all right. So next up is Michael Brennan's question. I know you've been typing this one out for a while. So excited to get to this. Um, so following up on Matt's question, Scott, my sense is you're identifying the blockbuster as the royal road to the neoliberal unconscious is actually a key intellectual praxis for making the aesthetic and metaphysical claims relevant to MMT, leg sorry, MMT legible in ways different than economic arguments, especially because blockbusters are such useful cultural touchstones. Wondering if you could provide some vision or just comment on how this cultural analysis can gain traction as a popular critical mode. And then in parentheses below, drawing on that from my own experience that MMT aesthetics ends up coming up a lot uh, with my non-economic non slash academic scopes. Uh, yeah, I mean, right, so econ can be super, you know, it, it draws certain kinds of people um, either, you know, willingly or begrudgingly you know it's it's terribly you know sexist and racist as a discourse right um it feels exclusive it's designed that way on purpose um and so um yeah and I, and i think and it's so anti-interdisciplinary right um and it it thinks it just it has all all the answers on its own uh, on its own terms. And I think what I draw from Marxism and critical theory is that um, culture and aesthetics from, you know, high culture and, you know, Picasso and, you know, uh, who, you know George O'Keefe uh, to, you know, mass spectacles are just as much part of our political economic reality or just as much a, a part of economics as so-called economics is. So, you know, that's not new to me. That's, you know, I, t I take that from the tradition in which I was um, trained. Um, and I, you know, I really value that. And then I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think there is something about the blockbuster in particular that because I guess one thing is that it's such a worldwide influential and meaningful form to so many different people, it means that whatever it's doing and whatever its aesthetics are on about and what its pleasures are on about and its anxieties are, are what, what anxieties are being expressed and contradictions are being expressed, it means that a whole lot of people in the world are, are um, resonating with, with those forms, right? And, and so, you can learn a lot more about what it feels like to live in the 21st century in a neoliberal political economic global system by really attending to the nuances of blockbusters as opposed to certainly reading orthodox economics or simply just reading heterodox economics and then saying, well, yeah, now we have, now we understand how it works. You know, fiscal capacity is only limited by, um, you know, real resources, da, 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 right? That only goes so far. And then I think there's the issue of, uh, that I think was brought up in the comment of sort of popularizing, right? Or like that, that as an, to come back to Erica's point, um, right? As an, as an educational mechanism, if we can, um, we can speak and write and converse and teach one another about, hey, the kind of zero-sum, um, austere kind of assumptions and feelings that are in our blockbusters that, hey, maybe aren't right or aren't the full scope of what's possible, 
maybe that's true for economics too. Maybe that's true for political economy. Um, I think one more thing I'll say uh, while I'm at it is that, you know, in the case of the blockbuster and neoliberal political economy, I find all kinds of sort of like homologies, right? But I think it's important to that that critical theoretical analysis isn't just about homologies, right? Like sometimes there's, we, we talk about in the humanities, different spheres do different kinds of cultural work, or you might say political economic work, or, you know, um, that might be in tension with one another or responding to one another, right? So, um, so the, my reading of this dominant gravitropic visuality as resonant and homologous with certain notions of abstraction and certain notions of um, uh, of political economy is just one way of doing it. And then, I mean, I don't know, I feel like in there, there was a question like, how do we, how do we tell more people? And, you know, I, I don't know, we're trying. I mean, you know, we're, we're podcasting, we're, we're publishing, we're, we're trying to tell more people. All right, uh, third time is the charm. I think Raul can actually <laughs> ask this question now. So Raul, do you wanna uh, try to unmute? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Fuck, I just typed this out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> no, but uh, seriously, wonderful uh, talk, Scott. Thank you so Thanks. much. Um, I like hearing you play this jazz each time, so to speak. And I think it's it's much, the stakes are so intense now after COVID or during COVID, I should say. Um, and I really appreciate the ways in which you've brought that out. Um, naturally, I'm tying it to um, shit that I'm sort of playing with um, in specifically the digitization of, of money, yeah. um, which you know is sort of cast in a different light as a result of the distancing that we had to do. Um, I think that this is all extremely important because really the future of money um, or the political fight for it is really going to happen at the user interface. But really that I, by that, I think I mean aesthetics and, and material culture. Mm -hmm. um, the way that people interact with money is becoming the site of, you know, pulling it, people into new relations of power. That being said, I sometimes have some trouble like plotting the technology, trying to use your lens um, insofar mm -hmm. as I can, just like being like a bear picking up like a needle. Yeah. Um, but, you know, a lot of people say crypto, uh, you know, makes money more abstract, all that solid melts into air. I don't think that anymore. I think it capitalizes on a sense of um, individual control, but also the idea that you are safe on the chain. Yes. You yes. are part of something bigger. And, you know, in there, in the view of the, of the diehards, the blockchain eventually is totalizing, right? It collects yeah. everything. Yeah. And we have all yeah. of our financial information on the chain. Like something like Venmo is a little bit different. There's a different kind of intimacy, but there's still this like cloak of some sort of innovation collaboration. Yeah. Honestly, yeah. I would say like an idea that you are being cared for more than, than the legacy banking institutions would have cared for you. Yeah. It's this... It's a very strange thing. And then when we talk about the public side, you know, I think Fed accounts is like maybe the papal model. And my hope would be that digital cash would um, bind us together without the same sort of heaviness, I guess. I'm mm -hmm. talking about this all clumsily. And really what I just want to hear is sort of where you see um, your project helping us better interpret what's happening in terms of technological change. Yeah, those are great questions. And there's so many there. Um, so I guess I would say, yeah, uh, right, in many ways, right, so, so these fights are getting played out at multiple levels, right, and, and including y your work, right, at, at uh, federal legislative levels, but also, right, at the level of communities and interface design and aesthetics and culture. Right. And there's a reason why, you know, some jackass opened a crypto cafe in Tampa, you know, in the last year um, and, you know, didn't didn't open up a, you know, treasury e-cash, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, cafe. 
um, because the crypto communities um, have have a culture that speaks to certain neoliberal, you know, uh, problems and desires in very neoliberal forms. And so they're, they're, they're world building, but they're world building in ways that are, as we know, um, tapping into problematic modes, I guess, I guess I, on the one hand, I heard you saying, I'm not so sure always where my uh, aesthetic analyses can help us understand, but I think you started to do so, right? So, um, um, my, like my interpretation of all that solid and melts into air is is a is is a kind of fantasy. I think it's a it's a, I think it's a liberal ambivalence that then becomes a Marxist trope, um, and and nothing melts into thin air. I think that this is I call it a spectacle of disintegration as a trope in my book. Um, and yeah, I think that crypto in a weird way, it's, you know, it's not gravitational. I mean, Bitcoin is kind of gravitational with its like metalism, right? But like the blockchain is sort of uh, um, structurally kind of plays some of the same structural role that the, these gravitational um, aesthetics have done um, and that are doing in, in our, you know, immersive films and, and video games, right? It's, it's this sense of, it's a sense of, of immediacy and peer to peer, right? Touching, you know, E.T. and Elliot, you know, God and Adam, um, but that it, but Hecheity, but that expands to, yeah, become totalizing, right? And so you, the trust is based on this fantasy that as long as everyone in the world, you know, it's like that, coke commercial from the 70s like you know like or was it coke like everybody like joins hands across america or something um uh i might have botched that reference but um so it's like all of this virtual peer-to-peer -to -peer touching that then creates that caring security um that of course as we know is it actually insecure actually unjust and unequal actually destroying the environment and, and, and whatnot. Um, so I guess that would be like a direct extension of what I'm saying. Um, um, I guess, I guess another, another piece here that just to bring out that I guess I've already said, but I just to bring out is the care analysis, which is to understand even sort of vile and antisocial cultural forms um, as themselves, like not just pure as pure evil, but as, but as caught up dependently in a situation, in a system. Um, and that doesn't make them good, but, but to analyze them from, from the points of their vulnerability and the, and their desires for what's good or what they think is good. And I think that that kind of analysis opens up um, a broader sense of what's actually happening and what's at stake and what's powering these power plays uh, and what's powering th this culture building beyond just sort of reductive, this is a powerful force that must be stopped. Even if it is a powerful force that must be stopped. Thank you. I think that's, that's really helpful to me. I think it does sort of pry apart even some of the, just like the structural conditions and the contradictions and the thought of people who push this stuff. Like, I guess I've always thought that there's a different politics rendered by the coins and a different politics rendered by the chain, for example. And like, there's a sort of like battle within their souls. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're making me see it, I think a lot clearer. So thank you. Yeah. And I don't, you know, obviously like I haven't done, I haven't, flesh that out. I haven't taken that on, you know, and you're in those spaces and thinking about that a lot more. So yeah, I would just, I'd put the question back on, back to you. Right. Um, yeah. Well, I think this is a rich side of discussion going forward. I honestly, like the law doesn't have much to say about all this. And I found anthropologists in your work to be way more helpful in thinking about it. So a, a conversation to be continued, I think.
Yeah. And I get maybe the last thing I'll say on this is that, you know, I, I think the something that money on the left is certainly really self-conscious about. And I, I think that the NNT community in general is, is that right, we want to make, we want to make the public sexy again, or maybe sexy for the first time, right? We want, we want, you know, crypto is sexy to a lot of people, right? Because of its culture, because of, right. And because of the way it's responding to particular needs um, and because of the celebrities that are, you know, that are getting involved and, and, um, you know, we got a, you know, MMT is in the news. MMT is, you know, on people's minds. It's, it is, it's, it's influencing. It's, it's, it is world building, but you know, it's, it's not sex. It's not as sexy as the blockchain. And um, that's a problem. <laughs> and we have to work on that and keep working on that. So it's 9 p.m. And to me, it seems like that might be um, a great note to end on. But also, um, I want to, you know, if you wanted to continue, there's no reason in particular for us to shut this down. But I know you have a family to get to. So, like, obviously, feel free uh, to just give maybe some concluding remarks and um, then we can wrap this up. Sure. Well, thanks so much. Um... Does anybody have any final questions? I mean, people people can go. People don't have to stay. Does anybody have any more questions? Are there any more questions in the chat? There are a few more questions in the chat. If you would be interested in answering them, I don't want to pressure you, but if you want to answer, yeah, I guess there's a lot. Um, I don't know. I guess I do. I do have a family, and I do actually have a couple people over too. Um, yes. So maybe I should get going. Um, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Raul said, not as sexy as cash, baby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love it. Love it. Um, yeah, I don't I don't know if I have concluding remarks. I, I just want to say thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. And um, and like I said before, I'm pretty available. So if you know, you don't have to be into my book, you don't have to be into, you know, what I'm up to. But if you are intrigued, but intimidated, just know that you can ping me and I will, I will talk to you. Um, I, I love, you know, I love paraphrasing. I love trying to figure out different ways of saying things. Uh, so please, please don't feel intimidated uh, to do that. Thank you so much, uh, both for this presentation and, you know, making yourself available for future education. I know that, we at MMM will definitely be reaching out to have more events like this one um, and other educational events because that's what we're all about. Um, and again, I we really cannot thank you enough for your time. I I learned an immense amount. I'm sure everybody else did too. It's been really interesting. So thank you for coming and sharing your work with us.